Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 37. Sing this hymn, How Great Thou Art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods, and for its plains I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountains grandeur, and hear the brook, and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy will fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. That's a great hymn to introduce our scripture reading. That will be from Psalm 106. It's a little bit lengthy, but in this we see just how great our God is. In mercy grace and his forbearance and his salvation. When we read the word mercy in scripture, it is over all of his creatures. Grace is specific to his elect, but mercy, anything this side of hell is mercy. The fact that God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust is mercy. The fact that he feeds those who oppose him is mercy. So all of this we see here in Psalm 106. It begins with the word, praise ye the Lord. That word praise is actually the word, boast yourself in the Lord. If there's to be any boasting, let it be in the Lord alone. And how do we do that? Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Not just when things go our way, 
but thank him in all things because he's good for his mercy endureth forever that's his mercy over all of his creatures there's not anybody even if God were to cast them into hell they could say that somehow God was not merciful in the temporal things even that he gave to reprobates during their life here on earth if God ordains that a child breathe just a few seconds of air and then the Lord takes that child just that air that that child breathed was God's air and even that is a mercy but here's the question who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord there's capital L-O-R-D this is addressed to those of us that he's taught by his spirit can any of us say that we truly understand the depths, the breadth, and the height of God's works, his acts. We see certain things with our senses, our eyes, we hear with our ears, we touch things of this world, and yet how God works in all of this, we can't understand. I know a lot of people are being displaced right now over in Hawaii. That's a vacation spot. People go over there to have a good time. And all of a sudden, now the God of this earth is opening up that earth and causing lava the size of refrigerators to be shot up in the air by miles and come down and land wherever he pleases that to land. And people are just shaking in their boots. Every time they see another part of that earth open up, they fear, they run, because here comes what's underneath and has been there all that time. You say, well, why does it not explode at other times? Well, it's God's hand. This is his work. Not only his mighty acts in creation, but in salvation. Stop and think about what it is for God to save us sinner. Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment. The word is discernment. To whom God gives that understanding of who he is. And notice, he that doeth righteousness at all times. It's a singular. It's not speaking about any one of us, but how is it that we understand God's judgment? It is in him that is Christ that doeth righteousness. That word righteousness means justice at all times. He's just in his way of saving sinners. He's just in his way of condemning sinners. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor. You notice in the authorized version here, it has that thou bearest is in italic. This is where the translators added these words to attempt to make it to read more smoothly, but if you just read it as it is, remember me, O Lord, with the favor unto thy people. There is that favor unto a particular people. And how do we know what that favor is? He says, oh, visit me with thy salvation. What was the author here pondering? when he said, oh, visit me with thy salvation. He was looking forward to the time when God would visit this earth with his salvation. That's Christ. He's coming to this earth to pay the sin debt of his people. That's that favor of what he speaks there in verse 4 that is particular to his people for whom he did visit this earth with his salvation. Remember Simeon there in the temple that took the little baby Jesus in his arms and said, now mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And that's distinctive in the grace of God compared to his mercies overall. Which would you rather have? His simple temporal mercies and kindness and then be cast into hell or would you Rather be of this number. This is why the psalmist here says, Remembering me, O Lord, with thy favor. You can have all the temporal blessings of this world, but that's not salvation. Oh, to have this grace.
that I may see the good of thy chosen. See there in verse 5? That I may see the good of thy chosen one. Again, who does he desire to see but Christ? God's first elect. And that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation. So you can see the order. There's the chosen one, which is Christ, and the gladness of thy nation, that people that was given to Christ from before the foundation of the world, for whom Christ would come into the world and pay the debt, that I may glory with thine inheritance. God's inheritance is that people for whom Christ paid the debt. And here's where the psalmist owns his sin. And we can identify with this. Those of us that have found favor in the eyes of God, his grace, we confess we have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. So in order for God to show this grace, there's that acknowledging that we don't merit. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. <laughs> you stop and think, it hadn't been long that the Lord had brought them out of Egypt with a high hand, and when they got to the Red Sea, they automatically started complaining. <clears throat> but before we point the finger at them, put yourself in that situation. That's us. That's our fathers. That's our iniquity. Where Moses had to say to them, stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. Nevertheless, he saved them. He delivered them for his name's sake. Everything God does is for his name's sake, whether in things temporal or things eternal, that he might make his mighty power to be known. So again, in conjunction with what we read above in verse 2, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? What's behind those acts but the mighty power of the Lord? He rebuked the Red Sea also, dried up, so he led them through the depths as through the wilderness and he saved them. Here the word saved means delivered. It's a temporal deliverance from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. When God's pleased to act in his power, there's no enemy that can withstand his hand. Think about Pharaoh's army. The, the entire army perished. This was his elite forces perished in the sea. It says, then believed they his words. They sang his praise. And you think, well, there it is. They, their heart was turned to the Lord, but read the next verse. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Sounds like Religious people today, they get excited when they seemingly have answered prayer. But then soon they begin to pursue their own lusts again. That's a sign that there's been no true work of grace in the heart. And here verse 15 is a scary thought. He gave them their request. How many people do we know in this generation that thank God he answered prayer? But it says sent leanness into their soul because they serve themselves in reality, all the while calling unto to God. They envied Moses, also in the camp, and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. And a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burnt up the wicked. It's interesting, while... Verse 1 begins, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. He's good in that he saves even one sinner. But he's just in his condemnation. And who can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? When he's pleased, hear the flame burn up the wicked. That's a symbol of God's justice against wicked sinners. And with reason. 
because beside all this they made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Here's a verse in the Old Testament that Paul quotes over in Romans 1.23. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forget God, their Savior, and there it's Savior in the sense of deliverer of temporal things, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. There's a picture of Christ. Why is it that any of us are not consumed with the wicked? It's because there's that mediator that stands in the breach. Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. To despise the pleasant land is to despise Christ. To believe not his word is to not believe Christ, not to see Christ in everything that was taking place. The writer of the Hebrews chapter 4 said that they had the gospel preached unto them as unto us, and yet it was not mixed with faith. They saw all these things and yet did not enter in because God had not given them that grace. And rightly so. They murmured, verse 25, in their tents, and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. This is talking about false worship. The very reason why God scattered them into the lands in judgment was because they were idolatrous in this land that God had given them. But when they were scattered into those lands, they continued that false worship. So it justifies God and his judgments. Thus they provoked him, verse 29, to anger with their inventions. Men are always devising different ways to worship God. Notice the connection with verse 28. They joined themselves unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of dead, dead works. And men today are always trying to come up with new ways, contemporary worship, inventions. There's nothing new under the sun. It says the plague break in upon them. Then stood up Phineas in a type of Christ and executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. That story is in Numbers 25. It's as if the psalmist is just going through the Old Testament here, showing God's power and goodness and grace toward his people, but his condemnation toward the rest. It says, and that was counted unto him for righteousness and unto all generations forevermore. That word righteousness means for justice. If you want an example of justice, Phineas was that type because he slew the Israelite that was cavorting with the Moabites, and then God stayed the plague. So in that, Phineas was a type of Christ who exercised justice, upon whom justice fell, him bearing the sin of his people. And that serves here as a type of Christ's righteousness unto all generations forevermore. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. Here again is a picture of Christ who bore the contradiction of sinners against himself, because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. There's the difference. Moses spake unadvisedly. Our Lord never spoke unadvisedly. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And again, what works did they learn? False religion, dead works. It says there in verse 36, they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. 
Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Beware of these programs for children. What they call so-called child evangelism. Where they get kids to make a profession and make parents feel comfortable now that their child has made a profession and somehow now they're the Lord's. Or some that have their children ceremoniously baptized or sprinkled or whatever to somehow ensure that they're the Lord's. That's compared here to sacrificing their sons and their daughters unto devils. Beware and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed on the isles of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. There's a lot of that going on in religion today. As you'll hear some say, get them early. Well, what you're doing is confirming them in condemnation because they'll make a profession. They'll do whatever you ask them to do. And for me, that's what it is to shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and daughters when they sacrifice unto the idols of Canaan. You can't talk people out of a profession. Once they've made that profession, bless the Lord by His grace shows them it's false. They'll die holding on to that profession. That's, that's bloodshed. Thus were they defiled with their own works. Notice these words. This is so-called free will religion. Works religion. And went a whoring with their own inventions. Any new fandangled way of experiencing God or coming to God, praying, even Jabez's prayer as some people do, pray this prayer and you're going to see all kinds of things happen. All of that is a whoring. It's to go a whoring. Prostitute with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people. When it says his people, it's talking about this national Israel. Insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. That, that national Israel. And he gave them into the hand of the heathen. And they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times did he deliver them, again, temporarily, but they provoked him with their counsel, and there they were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, see, here's God's mercy again. There's none that could ever accuse God of being unmerciful. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction. When he heard their cry. Why was God even preserving them? Well it's because his seed. Was to come through this people. It was for his son's sake. Not for theirs. But his son's sake. And he remembered for them his covenant. And repented according to the multitude of his mercies. You know this is human language. That's used to help us understand. A change of mind in God. As we perceive it. But in reality there's no change. God purposed it all along. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. All that being so, here's the prayer of a true grace wrought sinner. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto, notice, thy holy name. How God can be just and justified and to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, his true Israel. We know Christ is the true Israel, so blessed be the Lord God of Christ. And those in him, from everlasting to everlasting, let all the people say, Amen. And then it stops or ends as it began. Praise ye the Lord. Boast, for to have our boasting, let it be. In the Lord alone. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. What a precious psalm. Cause us to meditate and consider just how great you are. Great is thy faithfulness unto such sinners as we are. I pray that we might not merely rejoice in your temporal blessings, for they are many. Our health, our well being, even what prosperity we have, we know comes from your hand. But Lord, 
surely save us according to your mercies and grace in Christ Jesus. But you're the prophet, a man, if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul. I pray that you would cause us as needy sinners to look to the Lord Jesus Christ alone. How we need that grace, even to look. Else we'd be just like these, crying out in affliction. You and your mercies and forbearance answered, and yet sending leanness to our souls. Oh, how we desire to have our souls fattened with the truth of your Son and grace and mercy in you. So we look to you as needy sheep. For that I give you the praise, honor, and glory in our dear Savior's name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books. Sing number 219, and then we'll get to our study in 2 Samuel 19. In the chorus, we'll sing this, Jesus died for sinful men, and Jesus died for me. You can see verses 1 and 3 were written by a gentleman by the name of Philip Dotridge, and then verses 2, 4, and 5 were added later by Augustus Topley. These were both men that believed strongly in God's sovereign grace. But you notice over on the right-hand side, Ira Sankey. He was actually D.L. Moody's song leader when he went around preaching different places. And he's the one who actually added the chorus. So that's why there's a disparity. For a long time, I would say, you know, verses 1 through 5 are solid, but then when you get down to the chorus, saved by grace alone, this is all my plea, Jesus died for all mankind, and Jesus died for me. That's what he believed. He believed that Christ's death was an atonement, a covering for everybody. And now what makes it effectual is when you believe, but that's not what the scriptures say. So, we're going to change that part right there. Jesus died for sinful men, and Jesus died for me. Grace is a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven with the echo shall resound, and all the earth shall hear. Saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died for sinful men, and Jesus died for me. T'was grace that wrote my name in life's eternal book. T'was grace that gave me to the Lamb who all my sorrows took. Saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died for sinful men, and Jesus died for me. Grace taught my wandering feet to tread the heavenly road, and new supplies each hour I meet. While pressing on to God, saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died for sinful men, and Jesus died for me. Grace taught my soul to pray, and made my eyes o'erflow. Was grace which kept me to this day, and will not let me go. Saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died for sinful men, and Jesus died for me. Oh, let thy grace inspire my soul with strength divine. May all my powers to thee expire, and all my days be thine. Saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died 
died for sinful men, and Jesus died for me. Let's take our Bibles and look together in 2 Samuel chapter 19. My text is from verse 16 down to verse 23, and I've entitled this simply, Judgment Deferred. And here we see an example of this in how David dealt with Shimei, who was of King Saul's family and had been an enemy of David's as he was being chased out of Jerusalem by Absalom. He was the one who went on the other side of the river and cursed David as he left. But now as David is entering back into Jerusalem to ascend to that throne that was rightfully his, we find Shimei accompanied by a large number of other men. In fact, verse 17 speaks of a thousand men of Benjamin. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. And we find him coming now. The scripture says they're hasty to meet David. Some might look at that and think, wow, what a conversion. Here's Shimei, when he was going out, was cursing him, and now look at here. So let's read this and see what we can learn. It says there in verse 16, and Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, which was of Baharim, that's where David had been, in exile, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Isn't that interesting? Mingling with the men of Judah, putting himself in that crowd of those that were David's of the tribe of Judah. But here he was with their number. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him and Ziba the servant of the house of Saul and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And they went over Jordan before the king had come to meet and greet the king. And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan. Look at this again and think, wow, what a conversion. From cursing and throwing, casting stones at the king, now bowing to him. And said unto the king, let not my Lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my Lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. So even he is anticipating objection and addresses David with what he knows David would remember of him, and yet he says, don't impute that to my account. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? All those right words. Therefore, behold, I am come the first, notice, the first <laughs> this day, of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord the King. Why does he say of the house of Joseph? Because Benjamin was Joseph's brother. Those were the, it was Joseph and Benjamin that were of Rachel, born of Rachel. So he is even leaning on and falling back on his family history in order to gain David's favor. Verse 21, Abishai, the son of Zariah, these were the priests that had accompanied David, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Abishai was one of the ones that wanted to go and lop off his head. Back there in, in chapter 16, verses 5 and 6, he objected to David being merciful. 
And David said, verse 22, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah, that ye should this day be adversaries unto me? Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? That's an important thing. This day. For do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? In other words, there's none that can say to him as a king what to do or what not to do. And in this I see a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where different ones attempted to influence him and how he dealt with even those who were avowedly his enemies. How many times it says in scripture the Lord answered not a word. Or he would not. He would say to them, to his disciples even, when they were going through Samaria, they were one that, that cast out fire from heaven, destroy those Samaritans. And the Lord said, you don't know what spirit you're of. You don't dictate to the king what to do, how he shows mercy or how he renders judgment. Therefore the king said unto Shimei, verse 23, thou shalt not die. We know he's not saying you'll never die. And it's in the context of what he said up there in verse 22. Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? So you have to understand that in the context. He's saying to Shimei, thou shalt not die, implication, this day. And the king swear unto him. In other words, here's where we see judgment deferred. Because we're going to see the rest of the story. Remember Paul Harvey, the rest of the story? There's a rest of the story here with Shimei. But for now, judgment deferred. And I want us to consider that because if you take a concordance and just run the name Shimei through the scriptures, you'll find four particular passages in all of scripture that pertain to him. But it's always in the context of, of forbearance toward him. He was always an enemy of the king and would die an enemy of the king. But for his own self-serving purposes, he pretended to be a friend of the king. I liken it to many people today in religion. You know, when it's storming and there's trials, they, they're crying unto God. It's like we saw in our scripture reading, Psalm 106. And when the Lord delivers them, what do they do? They become hardened in thinking that somehow they're being blessed and on they go. Only to face ultimately judgment of God. Such was the case here with Shimei as we're going to see. So in this chapter, in this portion, we see a contrast between what is true forgiveness and what is simply judgment deferred. If I were to ask you, what would you prefer? Just judgment deferred? That eventually, the Lord let me live a good life. Let me enjoy some success. And hear my prayers. and Let me have a good family and a good job. And all health, wealth, and prosperity for a season. And then be cast into utter darkness. Or would you rather to have true forgiveness? Whereby, because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you stand pardoned as a sinner, even if it means not having all the temporal blessings. I know for myself, by God's grace, I, I want to be one of that, that number. And God would be pleased to show grace for Christ's sake, and not just simply have the judgment deferred. Now, I'm going to explain to you why this is judgment deferred, but first thing I'd have us note here in this portion is that judgment, God's judgment, may be deferred even for many who confess their transgressions. Shimei is an example. He's asking forbearance from David, even though in his heart he was still David's enemy. That's typical of so many today that profess to be God's children, and yet... It says, Christ said of the Pharisees, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. There's never been a work of grace in the heart.
And we're going to see that with Shimei. There was never a work of grace done in his heart. Shimei was of the same family as King Saul, but all his lifetime he opposed the accession of David to the throne of Israel, even though that was where God had put him. There are people today that call themselves Christians that will give lip service to the Lord Jesus Christ so long as they get what they want. And you say, well, why does God answer their prayers if they're not truly His? Like we saw in Psalm 106, to send leanness to their souls. They actually become hardened in that state of mind that they're in, thinking that they're being blessed because they have all of these temporal blessings. We've all seen it. See, not a license plate of a brand new late model vehicle, you know. I'm blessed. They got what they wanted. And preachers are willing to preach that way for people. Tell them if you just confess your sins, if you'll just give your life over to God, you can enjoy all of these same blessings that I enjoy. Listen to them if you have the stomach to. I can't endure long. They're all saying the same thing. Health, wealth, and prosperity. Follow these steps. And it always begins with confession of sin. But here's where I would warn us, as in Shimei's case, never to judge one state by outward appearance or profession. When you read this here in 2 Samuel 19, if this is all we had, you would think, wow, there has been a conversion. There has been a work of grace. And this is why we always have to compare Scripture with Scripture and see everything in its context. And we're going to look at it here a little bit. But from outward appearance, everything that Shimei was doing here appeared to be the right thing. Right in down to verse 16 where it says he hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. He hasted. That's the same thing that was said of Zacchaeus. He hasted and came down. But it's not a physical coming to Christ that is salvation. Preachers today get people to hurry down and out. Make your Mark with God right now. Don't leave this place without settling this matter with Christ because you don't want to go out there and you never know when you might be taken out. So let's settle this now. There, there is a, a pushing of people to haste physically come to Christ. I like what I heard a preacher say one time. The scriptures do command us to come to Christ, but this preacher said, without bowing your head, without raising your hand, without moving from your place, come to Christ. There where you are. It's not a physical response that indicates salvation. Even with Christ in his day, there were many that followed after him, but as Christ declared there in John 2 and verse 21, he did not commend himself unto them because he knew their hearts. So judge not by outward appearance. Secondly, don't judge by numbers. How many people are taken up with how many people are attending these places of worship? And there's a competition to see how many can grow their congregations to the greatest number. Here, in verse 17, there were a thousand men of Benjamin. So it wasn't just Shimei. He rallied a whole bunch of his kinfolk. That sounds like modern day proselytizing too, isn't it? Bring your family. And the fact that they mingled themselves here with the sons of Judah. The sons of Judah representing that true people that David represented, the king of Judah. Type of Christ. Here they come, mingling themselves into this, this mix. Don't judge by numbers. There was those multitudes in John 6 that followed our Lord Jesus Christ. Not for the miracles, but because 
He broke the bread. They were, you talk about a nice welfare program. Let's follow this man. Because look at here, he can take the bread and multiply it. We'll never have to work again a day of our lives. We just follow Jesus. And yet, when he said unto them, No man can come unto me except it be given of my Father, they were offended. Like people today are offended because you won't glorify their free will. We had a visitor this past Sunday that was in our midst. And I was prayerful for her. She's one of our neighbors. But she got home and sat down by the date on the letter. Wrote on there how distasteful it was for her to attend this place. Not that the people weren't nice, but because I wouldn't give credence to her profession. And threw it back at me in the letter. Who are you to judge, saved or lost, based on profession. And her closing point was, I'm going to go find a church that believes like I do. Well, if you're your own reference point, that's like a person out there in the sea drowning. Hang on to yourself all you want to. How's that working for you? You can even find a life raft out there and float around in that life raft for how long? How long can you exist without food and water? Eventually you're going to die. And that's what happens with man's profession. But when the Lord said to these in John 6, no man can come unto me except it be given of his father. From that point forward, it says, in John 6 and verse 65 and 66, they, re they turned from him and followed him no more. Vain profession. But these were multitudes. And that's when the Lord looked at his little flock, his disciples, and said, Will you also go away? But his spirit was in them to where they said, To whom shall we go? Thou art the one who has the words of life, eternal life. But don't judge by numbers and don't be discouraged by the few. Christ called his flock a little flock. If there's even one of us that can, by God's grace, claim to be one of his sheep, that is a grace. So it's not in numbers. And don't judge also by outward gestures of humility. There in verse 18, when he was coming over on that ferry boat to carry over the king's household and do what he thought good, Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan. He was the first to do it, leading the way. Those outward gestures of humility. Paul writing to the Colossians in Colossians chapter two and verse 23, wrote this, of course, in verse eight, he says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So I'm thinking about Shimei. He was not after David. He wasn't seeking David's glory. He was just wanting to save his hide. And hide in doing so. Hide his true intentions. But here in Colossians 2 and verse 23, all directed by the Spirit writes, which things have indeed a show of wisdom. There's that appearance, outward gestures of humility. In what? Will worship. Will worship. That means worshiping according to this will and not according to the word. And what? Humility and neglecting of the body. Fastings is what he's talking about here not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. In other words, to quelch in any way the, the lust of this flesh. Can't be done. And so don't judge by outward gestures of humility. People can look awful humble when they're supposedly worshiping. Bow your head, some get down on their knees, and you go through these gestures. None of that 
indicates any true heart for Christ, just as here, Shimei, hasting and bowing down, falling down. And fourthly, I would say, don't judge just because the words seem right. If you just read here, Shimei's words in verses 18 all the way down to verse 20, it sounds pretty good. Lord, let not my Lord impute iniquity unto me. Don't attribute this to me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely. He didn't just say did in that day, but perversely. He knew exactly words to say to somehow try to win the favor of the king. He was requesting something of the king, though, that was only by the king's prerogative. Just like with Christ, all authority put into his hand to save as many as the Father had given you. This is not determined by the offender just because he said don't impute. Non-imputation of sin can only be called pardon where that sin is justly put to another's account and the debt paid. That's true. David in Psalm 32 prayed this same prayer that the Lord, blessed be the Lord who imputes not iniquity or sin to his account. You say, well, what's the difference between the two prayers? If you go to Psalm 32, which we'll do here just briefly, take a look at it, Psalm 32. Here's a difference between what David prayed for his own sin and what Shimei here is asking of David. It says in verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. That word forgiven means to be lifted up off of the sinner, and whose sin is covered. That's an important word, because until Christ came and paid the debt, sin could only be covered. What, what is the word covering but atonement? But he's asking for that sin to be covered until such time as Christ should come and pay the debt. And that's why he says in verse 2, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in the Hebrew language, that's in a double negative. So, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth no, not ever, iniquity, and who, in whose spirit there is no guile. Where was he looking? He was looking to Christ coming and paying his sin debt. Over here in 2 Samuel 19, Shimei is asking that his sin not be imputed to his account. And he finds comfort in the fact that David, in his forbearance, tells him, you'll not die today. But what's missing? There's no sacrifice. That wasn't of concern to Shimei. And it's, it's of no concern to people today. All they want is for God to forgive them without any interest in how it is God could be just and justified. And if they can get a sense of peace and pardon, forgiveness, and they think that they're safe because of how they've confessed or said right words, I will tell you that's only a temporal deliverance. Because unless the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the sin debt of the sinner, there is no Salvation, eternal salvation. Everything's but a temporal deliverance. And here's why I will tell you that judgment deferred does not mean necessarily pardon or justification. I give you the example. Here we're looking at Shimei, but I'll give you the example of Cain. When the Lord said to Cain, go and do good, which meant what? Find a sacrifice. Leave here the works of your hands. Go get a sacrifice and bring it. Otherwise, what do you say? Sin lies at the door. 
And when God pronounced judgment on Cain for slaying Abel, his heart wasn't turned to the Lord. What was his one thing that he said unto the Lord there in Genesis chapter 4? You can read it a little bit later. He said, my judgment is too much to bear. And what he wanted was God's assurance to at least give him a prosperous life. And God did. Cain was very successful in his life. And what he did, but when he died, he perished. That was it. Judgment deferred in his case, and yet ultimately condemned. Same thing could be said of Esau. Same thing could be said of Saul. Same thing could be said of Judas. How long was he there? And did he walk with our Lord? But his end was the death of the wicked. Now, when I tell you judgment deferred, and here we come to the end of the story, the rest of the story. If this Bible narrative had stopped here in 2 Samuel 19, then we might think somehow that Shimei had gained forgiveness of sins. But the record of Shimei picks up many years later when David is old and about to turn over the kingdom to his son Solomon. And for that I want you to look in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. This is why it's good to compare scripture with scripture. What about Shimei? Was he the Lord's or wasn't? Well, these are David's last words. And at his death, it says there in verse 1 of chapter 2, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. In other words, death. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. Solomon, as a type of Christ, was charged with keeping the law. We know he didn't. It was in type only. There's only one who has kept God's law, and that's God's son. But nonetheless, charged with this, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. That the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart, and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Well, there's only one faithful one that ever sat on that throne, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zariah, See, these are all related. Joab was related to Abishai, the son of Zariah. So there was some kinship there, but he says, Thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me, and what he did to the two captives, captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Ner, and unto Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. How long ago did that happen? Early on in David's reign. And yet David never forgot. And he says, Do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not this poor head go down to the grave in peace. It's time to execute Joab. So Joab's a, a type of deferred judgment where he apparently appeared to be serving David all this time, but doing his own thing and his way. And David said, don't let him go down in peace. But show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai, the Gil Gileadite, and let them be of those that eat at thy table, for so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom, my brother. Who determines judgment? Who determines grace? King David's acting here as a king. Type of Christ. And here it is in verse 8. And behold, thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, of Benjamite, of Bahurim, 
which cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Mahane. But he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him, but his hoar head bring thou down to the grave with blood. So judgment deferred. Ultimately, Shimei would die the death of the wicked, just like Joab. Some of these that appeared to be with David, but were not. And you can read about his death over 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 36 to 46. Even here, with this instruction, this is not done in vengeance. God's justice is not a vengeance where he's reacting. It's, it's determined according to his will. But if you look at 2 Kings chapter 2, this is many years later with King Solomon. In verses 36 to 46, you can, you can read that here. Let's say 2 Kings. Take that back. It's 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 36 and 46. 46. It says there, And the king sent and called for Shimei and said unto him, Build thee a house in Jerusalem and dwell there and go not forth thence any whither. Why did he want Shimei to stay in Jerusalem? Well, because there were those cities of refuge. He didn't want Shimei running to those cities. He was going to stay there in Jerusalem. For it shall be that on the day thou goest out and passest over the brook kingdom, thou shalt know for certain that thou shalt surely die, and thy blood shall be upon thy head. And Shimei initially said, Thy saying is good, as my Lord the king has said, so will thy servant do. And Shimei dwelt in Jerusalem many days. Again, judgment deferred. How long was he there? Well, he got feeling pretty good. The king said to stay here. I'm going to stay here. But as you read on down through that chapter, you'll see where ultimately Solomon sends for him and calls him. Said unto him, Did I not make thee to swear by the Lord and protested unto thee, saying, No, for a certain on the day thou goest out, walkest abroad any whither, and thou shalt surely die. And thou sayest unto me, The word that I have heard is good. Well, he got up and went out. He died in the in the previous verses. At the end of three years, it says that two of the servants, verse 39 of Shimei, ran away unto the Achish, son of Maka, king of Gath. And they told Shimei, saying, Behold, thy servants be in Gath. And Shimei arose and sat on his ass and went to Gath. That's that free spirit that people have. If the Lord even said, Stay here and rest in Christ, they can't. They'll follow after their own heart. As it says there in verse 44, the king said moreover to Shimei, Thou knowest all the wickedness which thine heart is privy to, that thou didst to David my father. Therefore the Lord shall return thy wickedness upon thine own head. King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, which went out and fell upon him that he died. And the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. And be those in that day who will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many mighty works in your name? And the Lord said to them, Depart from me, you will make the kind of evil. I'm thankful that for those that are in Christ, our judgment has not been deferred. In the Old Testament, it was deferred because it was purposed to Christ. And when he came and paid the debt, all of the sin of his people from the Old Testament put away at that point. Same with us. If we're the Lord's, the only thing we can say is our judgment has been upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Else we're no better. We deserve exactly the same as any enemy. May the Lord receive all the praise and glory. Well, let's take our hymn books and close with this hymn 209. 209.
And we sing this hymn of verse 1. There where the blood of the Lamb was shed, it wasn't just spilled, it was shed. And in verse 4, not will you this moment his grace receive, but do you? In this matter of receiving his grace is by God's grace. And then we'll sing in the chorus, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that has part and cleansed within. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was shed. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that has pardoned and cleansed within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge of mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that has pardoned and cleansed within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is glory, not crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that has pardoned and cleansed within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. Freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, do you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that has pardoned and cleansed within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, have a good evening. Lord willing to see you next time.